Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and today we're going to be talking about a very interesting discovery that finally proves the ideas we had about why it works. And more specifically, it actually helps us understand how the white dwarfs evolve and what it all means for the future of the galaxy. Because as you might already know, in a few billion years from now, the entire galaxy is going to have nothing but white dwarfs left in it. Let's talk about this and welcome to What the Math. Roughly around 97% of all of the stars in our galaxy, including our sun, are going to become white dwarfs and stay as white dwarfs for trillions of years. Now obviously we're going to have other objects like neutron stars and black holes and things like brown dwarfs, but most stars will become white dwarfs. As summarized in this illustration made by European Space Agency. So here you see that the larger stars which usually only live for a few million years go supernova and produce either a black hole, a neutron star or nothing. And most of the other stars like our sun or the red dwarfs that are the most populous stars in the galaxy all end up as white dwarfs at the end. The only difference here is of course being brown dwarfs which usually just turn into the tiny black dwarfs at the end. And so understanding the white dwarfs, their evolution and of course their properties is kind of important in order for us to understand the future of our galaxy and of course the future of our own sun as well. But trying to understand white dwarfs and trying to understand what goes on inside of them is also important because it actually relates to quantum physics. As a matter of fact, the material produced inside of a typical white dwarf is a type of a quantum state gas. It's not a gas that you find in everyday life, it's a gas that can only exist when extreme conditions are applied to it. So for example, if we were to take a lot of stellar gas and then start squeezing it into the size of a typical planet, it will eventually reach a state that we call degeneracy state. Specifically, it's actually called electron degeneracy. What actually happens inside is that a typical atom gets squeezed so much that the electrons in these atoms cannot actually move anymore and have to assume the lowest energy that they have. And because according to physical principles, atoms cannot occupy the same space and neither can electrons, trying to squeeze all of this together even more becomes somewhat difficult. At least this is the classical physics explanation. There is a small caveat though, and this is actually related to the quantum physics and the explanation by the brilliant Subrahmanyan Chandrasekhar who was an Indian-American professor slash Nobel Prize winner who was able to theorize and explain what would happen inside of this very extreme type of gas. And what he realized is that, well, because of the quantum physics, electrons also have another property called spin. And in these extreme conditions, spin actually starts to matter. As a matter of fact, as you squeeze the gas even more and more by, for example, adding more mass to it, the electrons inside of this gas will now start assuming the same position with one electron being spin up and the other one being spin down. Meaning that as you add more and more mass into the white dwarf, instead of expanding as you would think logically, it actually starts shrinking, it starts to decrease in size. And Chandrasekhar back then defined this as the so-called mass radius relationship. This was actually theoretical for almost 100 years now. And in his calculations, he also realized that this type of a very strange gas also has its limit. At some point, if you were to add approximately 1.44 masses of our own sun into this gas, which we can do in this simulation as well, it actually is going to collapse even further, most likely releasing a tremendous amount of energy and generating a supernova. We now call this the Chandrasekhar limit. This limit is very well known to us and is actually very important in cosmology because it allows us to use these white dwarfs as a kind of a measurement candle for different distances across the universe. But although we know so much about the white dwarfs and we've also been able to find so many of them, this right here is by the way pointing at the nearby Sirius B that you can kind of maybe see if you have a good enough telescope but it's actually really difficult. There are still quite a lot of mysteries about them and more specifically we've never really been able to physically prove this mass radius relationship. We know it's theoretic but we don't really know if it's true. At least we couldn't until now. This recent paper that was just released by the scientists at John Hopkins University have now discovered a very good way for us to actually prove this idea and to show that Indeed, the more massive white dwarfs 
are actually smaller in radius. In other words, here we can demonstrate this by adding mass to this white dwarf in the simulation. If I start adding mass to it, you'll notice that it starts shrinking. And this mass radius relationship is based on quantum physics, but they were able to prove it using the visual observations. And once enough mass is reached, obviously, this white dwarf will become so, so compact that it's no longer going to be able to sustain even the electron degeneracy, and the protons and the electrons will start combining, forming neutrons, creating a large explosion. And if large enough mass is added, it can actually produce a neutron star as well. And in this case, this white dwarf is about to go supernova as it reaches its mass limit. So this is what we call Chandrasekhar limit. But the brilliant part of this study is, of course, in how they were able to prove all of this. For this study, they used approximately 3,000 different white dwarfs and looked at them, trying to measure the redshift of the light coming from those white dwarfs. Redshift is the effect you get from the motion of various objects. So, for example, if an object is moving toward you really fast, its light is going to become more blue shifted and it's actually going to appear more blue. And if it's moving away from you, the light will appear more red. As an example here, you can kind of guess that if these two white dwarfs are exactly the same, but this one appears brighter and more blue, yet this one appears more red, it means that this left one is moving toward us and the right one is moving away from us. But it also may mean something else. It might mean that one of them has more gravity on the surface and the other one doesn't. In other words, if the surface gravity of this white dwarf is lower, and in this case, if you were to stand on the surface here, you would experience the gravity roughly equivalent to 380,000 times higher than on planet Earth. The surface gravity on the more massive and the smaller in size white dwarf is actually about twice that, so even higher. So about 750,000 gravities of Earth. And so the scientists in this paper took 3,000 white dwarfs with the measurements of their radius already known, and they looked at the redshift visible from these white dwarfs. They obviously discovered that some white dwarfs were more redshifted than the others, but some of these redshifts could have been actually due to the motion across the galaxy. So to try to negate these values of different motion across the galaxy, they essentially combined the white dwarfs by size and then averaged out their redshift. Essentially, if two white dwarfs are moving in different directions, their redshift altogether should be around the same. And by looking at only the average value of the redshift, the scientists were then able to estimate the relationship between the size and, of course, the mass of each of these white dwarfs. Because here, the only reason that this left white dwarf would be more redshifted than, for example, this one here, is because it has a lot more surface gravity. And if their mass is not dramatically different, the only way for a white dwarf to get surface gravity is to actually decrease in size. And so naturally, this is how they were able to prove the so-called mass-radius relationship. The more massive the white dwarf is, the more surface gravity it is going to have, and more redshift it is going to get as well. Although just a side note, this is obviously very exaggerated colors here. They never really get that red. But in a nutshell, this is actually a pretty brilliant study and it's an excellent way for us to finally prove a theory and do so by combining a lot of observational data from across our galaxy. Which also, of course, proves the theories from Chandrasekhar that were originally postulated over 90 years ago. Something that wasn't even proven when he was still alive. But most importantly, this also combines the two very interesting ideas. One from Einstein, the redshift effects, and one from quantum physics. And both of these ideas once again prove to us that our understanding of the universe for the most part seems to be kind of correct. We do seem to understand how the universe works, how the quantum physics affects various small and also very large objects, and of course how various stars are affected by these quantum physics effects as well. But for now that's kind of all we know about white dwarfs and once we learn more I'll make sure to follow this up with another video. Thank you so much for watching, subscribe if you still haven't, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, and maybe come back tomorrow to learn something you may have not known before. Also, maybe support this channel on Patreon because it does help me quite a lot, and you can also support this channel by buying the wonderful person t-shirt, you can also find it in the description below. I'll see you tomorrow, space out, and as always, bye bye.